Hey, how you doing? Do Christians hate women because Christians hate abortion? Well, I want to talk to you about three ways you can express yourself as pro-life and pro-woman and not have any contradiction between the two. You must have heard someone say by now, ah, oh, you Christians, you're all so misogynistic, you know. You hate women, you want to rule over your women, you want to control what women can do with their own bodies, you're against abortion, so you're obviously against women. In fact, there's a, a sign you see in yards that say a number of different beliefs that people have, one of them being women's rights are human rights. Now, usually these days, when people talk about women's rights in that context, they're really talking about what they call reproductive rights reproductive rights, specifically abortion. Uh, of course, you and I would agree with that sign, wouldn't we? Women are human, so their rights matter. So yeah, women's rights are human rights. That's a human rights issue. And uh, let's not get too cavalier about that. I mean, the, the knee-jerk reaction is to say, oh, well, of course we all believe in women's rights. And what a ridiculous question to, to ask whether or not we support women's rights. But, uh, you know, come on. To this day, there are plenty of societies in which women have no rights, in which they are at least subordinates and at worst subhuman. Now, that's true. That's true. And we can't pretend that we haven't had the problem in our own country. In our own country, for heaven's sake, how long could women not even vote, own their own property, manage their own finances? I mean, misogyny isn't a myth. It's real, and it's real to this day. There's no question about that. So so with fl some flexibility, I think all of us are going to agree, yes, women's rights are human rights. But when you start defining women's rights as reproductive rights, including and generally referring to abortion, Okay, that's where things get tense. I mean, wow, when Roe v. Wade got overturned last year, how many cultural influencers, actors, and politicians, and philosophers went on camera and said, man, it's a national state of emergency. Abortion has now been made illegal, which wasn't true. Um, actually, the Supreme Court decision simply said that each state could decide whether or not it would um, legalize or, or illegalize abortion. But um, the argument basically came out that now we've got to have sanctuary states and sanctuary places where women can freely go for an abortion and the right to abortion needs to be protected. And, and, and the way the issue is framed, it, it's, it's pretty much like people are saying, hey, it's already settled that a woman has a right to choose and those who would deny that right are women haters. So people who oppose abortion are seen as people who hate women. Most Bible-believing Christians oppose abortion. Therefore, people conclude most Bible-believing Christians hate women. That puts you and I on the defense, and the subject does come up. I know on the one hand, man, we've been talking about this, what, since 1973, so 50 years. That's a long time to keep talking about something, and I think a lot of us have what you might call abortion fatigue. The subject has just gotten old. But let's not lose sight of the, the fact that this is a life or death issue. It's a life or death issue. And we're on the defense if we hold the traditional view that life begins its conception and life in the womb is life in the womb. So uh, let me point out three things you can use in your defense, three basic concepts. First, redefinition. Let's start with that, redefinition. The name reproductive rights, it's misleading. So you want to challenge that term reproductive rights. You're at the dinner table, the subject comes up and somebody says to you, why? Why do you not support reproductive rights for women? Well, nobody's arguing against a woman's right to reproduce and have children. Nobody's arguing against that. And nobody's arguing against a woman's right to avoid reproducing, as in avoid getting pregnant. Nobody is arguing against that right. Should even people who hold the view that all forms of contraception are wrong, and personally, I do not hold that view, but even those who hold that view would argue that, of course, a woman can choose to still keep herself from getting pregnant by more natural means. So we're for reproductive rights. We believe every woman should have the right to choose whether or not to become pregnant. We are against destroying the result of reproduction. Now, that's a fine point, but it's an important point. We're for reproductive rights. We are also for the rights of the life of what has been produced. So saying we're against reproductive rights, that's inaccurate. You want to challenge the term because it implies something that isn't true. And that leads to 
restriction. Who gets the right to challenge that view? Restriction. Um, so often these days, people frame the argument in, in a way that pits men against women. A real common argument you hear, if you're a guy and you speak up on abortion, people will say, ah, no uterus, no opinion. If you're not a woman, you don't even have the right to talk about this. It's a women's issue. It's not a man's issue. Basically, shut up. All you men don't realize that abortion is a women's issue, and that's why you all oppose abortion. Well, first of all, it's not at all true that all men oppose abortion. In fact, Gallup poll just last year showed that the majority of men polled support the right to abort. 48% of men surveyed, as opposed to 47% who are pro-life, are pro-choice. Now, I disagree with that majority, but it's inaccurate to say that most men um, oppose abortion. In fact, evidently, um, we've reached a point in our society where the majority of men do support the right for a woman to choose to have an abortion. I wish that was not true, but it is true. Uh, full disclosure, I was one of those guys who supported um, the right to abort. I, in 1978, did um, have an affair with a woman who was married she became pregnant as a result. We talked about her pregnancy, and we both agreed that she should have an abortion. I fully supported that at the time. I felt that abortion was just um, a rather inconvenient means of birth control. No big deal. Didn't think anything about it. Oddly enough, a few years later, the person who really opened my eyes to what abortion was in and of itself was a friend of mine who was a lesbian activist who also happened to be a nurse. And she said, hey, I'm a feminist, but Joe, I have seen the results of abortion. And when I saw them, I was basically looking at a trash can full of dead babies. I will never be a part of that again. See, abortion is not just a woman's issue, is it? If that is a human life that is being taken, then that isn't a women's issue. It's not a men's issue. It's a human issue. Both male and female babies are aborted. Men and women are both affected by that procedure, and everybody has the right to assess the issue of abortion, not just the right to choose or, or vague euphemisms like women's rights, reproductive rights, the thing itself, abortion, what happens. Everybody has the right to look at that and assess it. That's what led, for example, Dr. Colleen Malloy, a neonatologist and a faculty member at Northwestern University, to say, well... And I quote, the more I advanced in my field of neonatology, the more it just became the logical choice to recognize the developing fetus for what it is, a fetus instead of some inhuman form. Now, at this point, some would want to divert the argument from what abortion is to the woman herself and say, well, what about the consequences of making abortion illegal? What about threats to the woman's life? What about the problems of back alley abortions? If abortion is made illegal in some states, that'll drive women to go to these back alley butchers who are going to uh, basically mutilate them and, and do them serious harm. And, and those are both, by the way, pretty serious points, but they divert from the question of whether or not that is a life within the womb. But let's, let's look at the threat to life issue. Well, if we make abortion illegal, women's lives will be threatened because women seek abortion so often because they've been raped or, or because they've been impregnated through incest and some terrible thing. Their emotional and or physical life will be threatened. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Just a few years back, the Connecticut Department of Health was asked about the number of abortions that were per performed to preserve a woman's health. Here's what they had to say, quote, neither state or federal law nor regulations define the phrase preserving the life or health of the woman. Representatives from various health and abortion agencies suggest both state and federal laws leave the definition of preserving the life or health of the pregnant woman up to the expectant mother's physician, end quote. Did you catch that? <laughs> the, the Connecticut Department of Health was very plainly saying, hey, neither the state agencies nor the federal agencies want to take on the challenge of what it means to preserve the life or the health of the woman. So what we say is defer that to the physician. So now there's no longer even an objective definition of what the life or health of the mother means. Does it mean she's going to be inconvenienced or does it mean her life is really endangered? Well, that's exactly what inspired the Guttmacher Institute, which is, by the way, a pro-choice, pro-abortion advocacy group to say this. Um, the most cited reasons that women seek abortions are the following. A pregnancy will dramatically interfere with education 
work, or ability to care for dependents, or there is an inability to afford the baby, or there are limited resources and there are responsibilities to others. To a varying degree, those are serious, but they certainly don't constitute threats to the life and the health of the mother, which is why the BBC wrote in an ethics journal, quote, the self-defense argument for abortion seems to fail here because although a threat to life can be a defense to a charge of killing someone, None of the above reasons would be an adequate defense of homicide. So the threat to life argument does not hold up very well. Neither neither does the back alley abortion uh, argument, the idea that, oh, if we criminalize abortion, it'll drive women to in droves to back alley abortions. Dr. Bernard Nathanson is a founding member of the National Abortion Rights Action League, and he said, quote, statistically, We always said that the number of back alley abortions were 5,000 to 10,000 deaths per year as a result of back alley abortions. I confess I knew the figures were totally false. And I suppose the others did too if they stopped to think about it. But in the morality of our revolution, it was a useful figure. Anything within reasons that had to be done was permissible. Now think about that for a minute. So many of the arguments we hear about abortion by which somebody says, you must hate women if you don't want a woman to have the right to an abortion, because if that right is denied her, her health, her life will be threatened and or she will be driven to the sinister procedures that will endanger her. Those were all largely, almost entirely based on statistics that were inflated and arguments that were spun out of thin air just to achieve a pro-choice society, basically a pro-abortion society. So one can hold the viewpoint that a woman's life is, of course, worth preserving and that women are very important, but know that that, that, uh, uh, the the, uh, criminalizing of abortion does not threaten the life and the health of women, nor does it drive them to back alley abortions in any any near the numbers that people have put out there. Then finally, there's the redirection approach, redirection. Uh, Redirection works pretty well because if, if you're arguing about a thing, and people don't want you to be thinking about the thing, they'll redirect the argument to something else and try to win the argument there. That's what's been done with abortion. Have you noticed how rarely people talk about whether or not that is a human life within the womb? The arguments are largely about the woman's right to choose, the woman's right to do what she wants to do with her own body, the health of the mother, the life of the mother, and so forth. Um, That's an important question. The rights of the mother to live, well, yeah, that matters, but the more important question is the right of a child to live. Are we going to, I mean, we're making a choice basically between the right of one person to live more the way they want to versus the right of another person to simply live. Are we talking about enhancing a woman's life at the expense of destroying another person's life? This is one of the reasons why in uh, one of my favorite plays, Lorraine Hansberry's A Raisin in the Sun, the lead character is in financial difficulty. He and his wife live with his mother And uh, all of them struggle to get by. Uh, The wife already has one child, and now she has learned that she's pregnant again. And so she has admitted to her mother-in-law that she is going to get an abortion. And right in front of uh, the mother-in-law, she has said to her husband, I've hired a doctor to get rid of this baby. And the mother looks at her son and she says, well, son, I'm waiting to hear you say something. Your wife says she's going to destroy your child, and I'm waiting to hear you say that we are a people who give children life, not who destroy them. If you're a son of mine, tell her. This isn't a secondary issue. I know it's an old issue. I think abortion is like a lot of things. It's lost its shock value. Sort of like porn has lost its shock value. Fornication has lost its shock value. Adultery has lost its shock value. These are all life-threatening things, but abortion in particular is not just life-threatening. It's life-destroying. Lost its shock value, but that doesn't mean it's lost its shock value to God, only to us. Which is why I honestly think that uh, what this character in Lorraine Hansberry's play um, said to her son is what God would be saying to believers today. If you're a child of mine, Say that you support women's rights and men's rights and children's rights and that you don't think one has to be destroyed for the sake of the other. Well, 
I'm hoping those three points can help you in your own discussions on abortion. The issue is not going away anytime soon. We need to be equipped to address it from a biblical perspective and in a way that's relevant and compassionate. And that's what this podcast is all about. If uh, you're enjoying these podcasts and you haven't yet subscribed to Christians in a Cancel Culture, please subscribe. Hit that uh, subscribe bell. And uh, if you would, in the comments, let me know that you subscribed. I'd like to thank you personally for that. Also, if you haven't yet picked up a copy of, a copy of my book that this uh, podcast is based on, Christians in a Cancel Culture, you can get that through Amazon.com. The book is written to help you to uh, discuss abortion, homosexuality, transgender, racism, or progressive Christianity in a logical way. And it's got some sample dialogues and talking points that might be useful to you. And if you do like the content that we're putting out here on this podcast, uh, why we'd love to have you align yourself with us as a supporter. If you want to help support this ministry so we can go on providing free content, just go to joedallas.com slash giving, joedallas.com slash giving. And uh, you'll find how you can uh, support this ministry and partner with us in this work. Well, this is Christians in a Cancel Culture. We're here every Friday. I'll be seeing you next week as we can uh, continue this series on those yard signs you see that say, we believe. We'll be hitting on more of those next week. Meanwhile, let's keep in mind the advice Paul gave to Timothy for anyone who wants to be a servant of the Lord. The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle to all, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those who oppose themselves, if perhaps God will grant them repentance according to the knowledge of the truth, 2 Timothy 2, 24 to 25. Hey, let's keep that in mind, okay, when it comes to the truth. It is not just where you stand, it's also how you stand. Hey, it's good seeing you. Thanks for being here. God bless.